I remember you. The inn was filled with a great crowd of people, some delegates to Anvil on their way through to the summit of the Great and Good, others those who were making the pilgrimage to Bastion, or journeying down the coast to the necropolis. There were a few soldiers even, resting after being withdrawn wounded from the fighting with the Cold Sun's heralds to the north. At this crossroads inn, built long ago at the dawning of the Empire, one imperial life could be found. Not just imperial life either. In one corner, a figure dressed in dark, sepulchre robes held court. Grim porcelain mask slung askew around her neck. Whatever it was she was talking about, it had held the attention of more than a few curious travellers. Or perhaps they were just entertained by an eccentric foreigner half deep in their cups. Or curious about the large shield of unfamiliar design that, even in her somewhat inebriated state, she held close to her knees. And another thing. Why do people keep asking me about necromancia? Do they believe every axe was born knowing the secrets of such things? Do they think we learn the secrets of bone and sinew on our wet nurse's knee? She took another swig of the tankard in front of her, dark lipstick slightly smearing. I mean, I want to help these people. She pulled out a letter from within her robes. Look at this poor man. I'm interested in using true bone dust to help beat back a... a winter valorn? Is it? Oh, my goodness. Is there anything you people... Do you know anything about the potions of your people? I don't. I just don't. She slammed her hand down on the table, slightly too hard. Her drink dropped to the floor with a crash that broke the hubbub of the inn, the crowd cheering in the universal cadence of the barfly who had seen another come to the drunkard's misfortune. Embarrassed, she leaned down to pick up her now-empty tankard. Rising, she continued, slightly quelled. I'm not angry, but I'm a theologian. I can tell these people what the root of their problems is, of course, but that's the one thing they don't want to hear, of course. Oh no, the Empire is beset by misfortune on all sides but suggest that in any way it's because of some fundamental wrongness in the world, some malignancy of the hands that shaped it, then I'm the heretic. She opened her mouth again and seemed to think better of it. No, no, I ought not to, poor ambassador. If I get in trouble again, he will worry. One of her hands reached down, touching the shield. He's a kind soul. Doesn't deserve a headache like me. <laughs> ha! She grinned mischievously. Well, he has me anyway, whether he likes it or not. She rose. Good night, all. A pleasure, as always. She threw some crowns down onto the table. Drinks are on me tonight, but after bed, Anvil awaits. Overview The winter solstice is nearly upon us. By road and trod, ox cart and shank's pony, the great and the good, if you squint, make their way to Anvil for the summit that will shape the empire for at least the next three months. As well as the usual visitors, and those coming for the first time to stake their claim to imperial destiny, we have all the other people who make this trip, with their own agendas, or some just with drugs to sell. Some of them are familiar, others quite new. This season there are the now familiar traders from Axos making what might be their final trip. An Axu theologian on a mission of learning. Song seeking songsmiths. A Varushkin merchant back from their holidays with a report from the Commonwealth. A student of astromancy with worries for everyone. A stargazer with more than enough portents of doom and sorrow to go round. Archipelago the Rising Leviathan, whatever that is. Fool business warlocks looking for investors, and a gift for the coronation, although who is carrying it is not clear, and may be a cause for some alarm in some quarters. Apothecaries of Axos Evander Slack is bringing his Axu concoctions to Anvil for probably the final time. They will trade from outside the forge, from 1330 on the Saturday of the winter solstice, and will stay either till they run out, or until the coronation procession is concluded. A regular sight on the road to Anvil, Evander Slack of Caban, the Axu, not the infamous former sorcerer, and his associates are of course travelling to the Empire for the summit with their usual array of exotic concoctions, for use as both practical and recreational. Drugs. They're selling drugs. Evander does apologise that some issues with production mean that there'll be no red lotus available to purchase this season, but that all orders made last summit have been fulfilled. He also announces, with apologies to regular customers, that currently he foresees this as the final visit he will make to the Empire to sell his wares. There is a notable additional person accompanying the pharmacopial contingent this season. A Cambian draped in finery introduces themselves as Ilark Kither Deanera of Caban, and they are keen to emphasise to passers-by that they have nothing to do with Evander's business dealings, and are simply travelling alongside the traders on their way to the Empress's coronation. Do they have anything of their own to sell? Such questions earn only a wry smile and a request to meet them in Anvil. The trader group expect to arrive around 1330 on the Saturday of the winter solstice, 
and will set up shop in their usual spot outside the forge. Ilark Deanera presumably intends to attend the coronation, but beyond that, their itinerary is not public knowledge. Academic with interests The Anxio Academic Theodosia of Ipatavo intends to return to Anvil for the winter solstice. She is expected to arrive around 1600 on Saturday afternoon. Evander and Kither are not alone in planning to visit Anvil during the season of celebration. The Aksu theological scholar Theodosia of Epotavo visited during the autumn and has since then split her time between various places of learning around the empire. A relative of Grand Ilarg Adonai of the gates of Epotavo, she is believed to have the artifact shield Born Watch in her possession, the missing shield of vigilance. She is apparently keen to renew the acquaintance of Fintan Nighthaven and then visit some new friends in the League following her attendance at the Printers Guild Ball earlier in the year. Theodosia of Ipotavo has suggested she is open to receive winged messengers from Imperial scholars during her sabbatical in the Empire. She is staying at Mavanwi's Rest, Fishguard, Necropolis, for the next year. When not at Anvil, she spends a certain amount of time at the small house on the outskirts of Mavanwi's Rest that she has rented, and is open to missives from Imperial scholars, should someone wish to speak to her and miss her when she is at Anvil. It is worth noting that Theodosia is a theological scholar and not a practitioner of the necromantia, and queries about the latter are likely to lead to disappointment. She is expected to arrive around four in the afternoon and will make her way to the hub, hopefully to rendezvous with Fintan. Arias and Forgotten Songs Three songs, apparently written or recorded by Elaine Silverlark, have been found by one of the heirs of Lepidus. The songs consist of lyrics in the style of Highgard, Wintermark and Dawn, but there are no tunes. Copies of the lyrics have been given to the three refrains and the civil service at the hub to allow songsmiths to create their own musical arrangements. The heir of Lepidus involved will visit Anvil during the summer solstice to hear the musical arrangements. This season, the scholars who support the Lepidian librarian, the heirs of Lepidus, have largely been able to pursue personal research projects. One of their number, a highborn poet named Endric of Lepidus, has made an interesting discovery. Always fascinated with the life of Elaine Silverlark, they found a trio of songs misfiled in an old box that they believe may have been penned by the exemplar herself. The problem is that while in each case the lyrics are recorded, there is no indication as to the tune. Endrick believes, as they believe Silverlark did, the songs are meant to be sung. They are keen to hear from artists who are prepared to take on the challenge of working out arrangements for these three sets of lyrics. As near as the air of Lepidus can tell, the songs are adaptations of Dornish, Wintermark and Highborn originals but they cannot track those original songs down despite all their efforts. Given all this, Hendrik has made copies of the three songs and asks that any songsmith, bard, troubadour, Sedena or Scott interested in helping making the songs live again speak to the three refrains at Anvil. They've also provided a few copies of the lyrics to the civil service at the hub and asked them to pass the pages on to anyone who expresses an interest. Hendrik plans to visit Anvil in six months' time during the summer solstice and hopes to meet with musicians at that time to hear their arrangements. Under normal circumstances, Endrick would want to make copies of the arrangements and display them at Silverlark's inspirational tomb, but of course the example of loyalty famously does not have one. Instead, they intend to record the most effective and inspirational tunes and publish them for the benefit of musicians and pilgrims of loyalty across the Empire. Aura Report At the urging of the Assembly of the Way, a Varushkin merchant has taken it on themselves to investigate the claims of some Commonwealth paladins. They wish to meet with Kiva Tenfallen during the winter solstice to share what they've learned. They are expected at the hub at around 20 hundred hours on Friday evening, intending to adjourn somewhere for the best food and drink Anvil has to offer. Last season, Kiva Tenfallen and the Assembly of the Way declared their desire for further research into an allegedly blasphemous aura. Not an unusual thing to ask in itself, but made more so by its location, the aura in question being in the Commonwealth, half the world away. While such requests would normally go through the Ambassador to the Commonwealth, in this case the Assembly's words have found their way to some helpful ears. Josef Costa is a successful Varushkin merchant with a love of travel. They took Kiefer's words as a sign that it was time for an overseas break, and booked passage to the Commonwealth to see the sights and help out the Synod along the way. As the summit approaches, they have sent word that they wish to report their findings to Kiva and any interested parties from the Assembly. According to their travel plans, they will be arriving in Anvil at or around 20 hundred hours on the Friday. From there, they will proceed to the hub and meet with any interested parties, and finally from there adjourn to somewhere with fine quality food and drink to talk things over. Astronomancer Risks A Suak Astronomancer 
wishes to speak with the Empire's astronomers, especially those conducting practical research and who have experienced the dangers involved in such work. She has specifically named Kespuina Archgai, the members of Sakmajik, Serena Starsong, and the magicians of Storm's End as folks she'd appreciate speaking with. She's also interested to meet those who participated in a unique ritual experiment during the autumn equinox. Annuka Yuhaling will meet those interested at the hub at 1300 hours on the Sunday of the winter solstice. Suwak Astronomansa Annuka Yuhaling has announced that she will be journeying to Anvil for the first time to discuss some urgent matters of safety when practicing certain forms of astronomancy. While she is excited to see citizens pushing the limits of the art, she expresses concerns that several recent accidents have brought her to the conclusion that there should be some discussion around knowledge sharing and best practices among masses of the tradition. She comes with her own warnings of what happens when things go awry. She is keen to speak with other astronomers, especially those who invoke the wanderer in their rituals or research. She has also specifically named a few individuals and covens who she believes should hear what she has to say. Kespuina Archgai, the members of Sakmajik, Serena Starsong, and the members of Storm's End. She also wishes to speak to those involved with a strange and unique and horribly fatal ritual experiment that took place at the Anvil Regio during the autumn equinox. She trusts that those who were present will know what she means. She expects to arrive at the hub around 1300 on Sunday afternoon, assuming nothing goes awry. Apocalyptic Visions An Arisen stargazer preaches doom as they travel from their homeland to Anvil. They are apparently heading to the Brass Coast in Cameron to do... something, and are expected to arrive around 1900 hours on Friday. From the opposite direction to Anluka Yuhling comes a dishevelled Arisen, a rare sight, surely, bringing a message of doom. They seem to be a stargazer named Cassius, formerly of the Arch of the Sky. Apparently a mild-mannered astronomer, when the Druze came they escaped the fall of their spire, but the experience left them shattered in spirit, overwhelmed by grief. Shortly after the autumn equinox, they abruptly quit the spire in Morrow, where they have been given refuge, and set out on foot for Anvil, travelling by a highly circuitous route that avoided both the trods and any large concentration of people. As they travel along the roads from Cargo, they have been preaching non-specific visions of doom and sorrow. Those who have met them on the road describe someone unsettling, deeply disturbed, and bursting with the urge to communicate something they cannot put into words. By all reports, the closer they get to Anvil, the more galvanised they become. There's some indication they're specifically intending to visit the Brass Coast in Camwood, and it's anticipated they'll arrive around seven in the evening on the first night of the summit. Archipelago Aix. A titanic herald of Rianos, suffering some form of sickness, plans to travel to Anvil to seek the aid of mortal healers. They will arrive at 1700 on the Saturday of the winter solstice and head to the hub. Despite one of their common monikers, Archipelago the Rising Leviathan also known as Vast Moving Island of the Summer Seas, is a herald of Rhiannus, who has apparently visited the Empire before, but not for several generations. They have recently made contact with Imperial Summer Mages, explaining that due to an illness they have not been able to embody their usual adventurous spirit, and they fear for what this means for the future. They have found no cure for what ails them anywhere in the Summer Realm, and so since the illness doesn't seem to be passing naturally, and given it may have originated in the Mortal Realm, they intend to travel to Anvil to visit some of the Empire's best healers, on the off chance they can offer some relief. Digging into records by various covens has uncovered that the archipelago is apparently usually described as either a network of chalky islands, upon which the creatures of the Summer Realm are understood to live, or as a monstrous white whale, whose wake causes tidal waves. There is a strong suggestion it might be one of the titanic sea creatures that lend their power to the unbreakable behemoth strength enchantment. It has been known to visit Imperial Oceans in generations gone by, to challenge sailors to a wild hunt with itself as prey, and offering rewards of bountiful treasure to those who can best it. The last recorded instance of such a challenge led to the death of the infamous flamboyant corsair Flavio Iflav Iriqueza. The massive herald intends to visit Anvil, something that causes a little consternation in some quarters, for obvious reasons, and is interested in meeting any healers who may be able to help. It's a little vague about space and time, but is expected to arrive at 1700 on the Saturday of the winter solstice, and will be seeking directions to the hub. Attending at last. A group of Thule business folk attempted to come to Anvil in summer and autumn, but ran afoul of weather. They are returning this summit with a proposition for investment. 
they expect to arrive at 10.30 hours on Saturday and will head first to the Imperial Orcs camp. In summer, visitors to Anvil received word of a group of Thule merchants from the Five Fan Consortium making their journey to Anvil to discuss business with the Empire. Unfortunately for the past two seasons, the unpredictable weather and tremendous heat, which Thule are not accustomed to, forced them to turn back. They are apparently looking for imperial investment in some scheme back in Otgodov. Why they are looking for investment for the Empire, not among their fellow Thule orcs, is not clear. They are by all accounts pleasant enough. According to those who have met them on the road, they have possessed of some odd ideas. They appear keen to make an impression, and seem determined to make it all the way to Anvil this time, estimating they will get to camp on Saturday morning. And finally, from Branock with Love. The Charnel Lord welcomes a Varushkan throne. They intend to send a small gift to Anvil, to be delivered during the solstice, but there are no details of how or when that gift is to be delivered beyond during the winter solstice. In the hills of Branock sleeps the Sovereign. Its resting place is well known, but well protected. It never stirs from the tunnels and chambers beneath the ancient barrow. Indeed, its body slumbers in the sleep of death, but it is said its mind wanders where it will. It has minions, mortal and otherwise, and they are sometimes encountered in the hills of Karsk. The Charnel Lord has let it be known that it welcomes the ascension of a child of Varushka to the Imperial Throne. Last time the Empire was ruled by Varushka, its borders expanded like never before, and the nation itself became stronger. In recognition of this historic event, the Boyar of Branok intends to send a gift for Empress Vesna Borkovna Prochnost, a small token of esteem to be delivered during the winter solstice. Unfortunately, what the gift is, how it is to be delivered, and when it is expected to turn up, all seem to be details the Sovereign's agents have utterly neglected to provide. 